Let's not do that. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, so the first thing is, um, how's the volume? Is this comfy? All right, okay, so I want it to be comfy and then like maybe add like 10%. All right. <laughs> All right, so how's everyone? My name's Mark, I'm from Australia. You can't tell from my accent. Uh, and today I want to talk to you about some research I've been doing on probability bounds and their applications for bandits and etc. Uh, so, I mean, some of you may be familiar with probability bounds. Um, so, first thing first. Um, in the past two talks just then, and indeed yesterday, we've been talking about bandits, and one of the things that people have been mentioning is Hofting's bound. Hofting's inequality. And that is an example of a concentration inequality. And it is one of many, many concentration inequalities. And today I want to talk about a specific kind of concentration inequality called an empirical Bernstein bound. Now, an empirical Bernstein bound is a bound on the error of your sample mean, or your sample statistics that are parameterized by their sample variance. Right? And why do we care about this? Well, because we're data scientists and we use statistics to characterize our information. Yeah. All right. Now, I was thinking about how I would do this talk, right? and rather than just you know, speak and tell you about all the interesting things that I've been doing over the past year or so, I was thinking that I would instead, rather than just simply declare them and let them be into the ether, I would show you. And instead of telling you how we can do these things, I thought I'd talk instead, maybe instead, about how not to do these things, right? That it might be a little bit shorter and a little bit more to the point and it's something more appropriate for 15 or so minutes that I have. So I'm going to start by doing that. Now, I want to talk today about Chevy Chef's inequality. Now, I'm sure that you've all come across this one before. And I think that this is probably one of my favorite inequalities, right? It tells you that the probability that your random variable is more than k times the standard deviation is proportional or less than 1 over k squared. Right? So if your data point is more than 2 times the standard deviation away from its mean, then it, that probability of that occurring is like less than 1 on 4. Right? And now, if you think about this, this is simple, and it's also in a way kind of amazing. Because fundamentally, when you're using this kind of a thing, what you're actually doing is you're analyzing and using and manipulating your data under the assumption that the probability distribution of your random variable has a variance. And, and like, of all the things that you can assume probabilistically about your random variable, if you assume that it has a variance, that's pretty cool. That's very, very neat. Now, obviously, when we're data scientists, we don't really use like single value variables, right? We're using sets of them. And one of the things that we do is we take the sample mean, right? And Chevy Chef's inequality, with like a little bit of assumption of the independence of the samples, can be used directly to what is create a concentration inequality on the sample mean, just like so. And this tells you that the more samples you take, your accuracy improves in the order of about 100N. Right? And in practice, this is this is relatively informative, but like if you look at it, the one thing that we don't often have when we've got sets of data is that we don't actually know the underlying variance of our data. We, we, we can only estimate that via the sample mean. Right, now if we're going to be you know short to the point, I mean maybe if we take enough samples, we can just substitute the sample mean for the, the sample variance or the true variance. And like no one's going to shoot you if you do that, but you know it could use a little bit of improvement because you know I mean it kind of loses its analytical truth about it, and you're kind of assuming something like that. So the general question is: Well, if we want to bound our sample mean for our data, how do we do that? <laughs> I thought I'd just like post like this. This is the question, right? And if you can do that perfectly, please do, right? Like, oh yeah. You want like the mean bound, but like so. If you have the data 
and you've got your sample mean and your sample variance and what about it? How do you do that? Now I'm going to show you how not to do that. What's that? Using machine learning. Using machine learning. Right, so when you're using machine learning, you have to, especially when you're doing probability, you have to start with some data or like example sets or make some assumptions, right? And, and that's cool, you can do that. And I'm, I'm not saying that you can't, but to, to get something that is truly, truly powerful, you want to have your assumptions as little as possible. All right, now I'm going to show you how to do it or not to. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use Chevy Chevy and Apology again. But we're going to use Chevy Chev's inequality to bound the sample variance. Because Chevy Chev's inequality applies for any random variable you want. Right? So this is Chevy Chev's inequality for the sample variance. So the error of your sample variance is proportion is like in proportion to the square root of the variance of your sample variance estimator. Okay? <laughs> well, alright, fine. Uh, and if we do a little bit of math. As, left, as an exercise for the reader, we can get a relation that looks a bit like this, where the variance of our sample variance estimated is at least in proportion to the fourth central moment, which is even great. <laughs> All right, um, let's just like use this for a moment. And because we're being a bit rough, we notice that for n greater than three, that the first term there is negative. So what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of it, just because why not? And then that's going to that's going to give us a bound that the variance is less than one on n times the fourth central moment, which we can substitute directly in, right? And that gives us a bound for the sample variance in terms of the fourth central moment. All right. And what we're going to do is that's a double-sided bound there. So obviously we can convert a double-sided bound into a single-sided bound. If even for the cost of expanding that bound by a factor of two, <laughs> just because why not, right? And then now we got we got like there we arrived. We've got a bound for the variance, and we've got a bound for the sample mean. And then to put those two together, right? We're going to use a special relation called the probability union, which is weak, incredibly weak. Right. For any of our random variables a, b, and c, the probability that a greater than c is less than the probability a greater than b plus b greater than c. Yeah, don't ask. <laughs> anyway, and that gives us the relation down below, where we've got the k in terms of the first equation and the t in terms of the second. And we're just going to set k equals to t, because that, that works. We can do that. Right? It might not be optimal, but that'll do. Right, and then we get this. <laughs> and this is a probability bound for your mean that is parameterized in terms of your sample variance and the fourth central moment. Now, if your data is bounded, you've got a natural upper bound of the fourth central moment, which you can use. And this is an example of an empirical Bernstein bound. Are you impressed? Because if you're anything like me, you kind of like, you know, you just feel dirty inside by driving something like this. Right? Now the question is, alright, okay, this is cute. But why do we care? Right? So concentration inequalities are used in machine learning in various spaces, including bandits, and here's a, a shotgun of references to all the things that concentration inequalities can be used for. Right? And even in this talk and, and in the previous two and in yesterday. One of the concentration inequalities that is often used is Hoefding's inequality. Um, if you come across this thing, if you know what it is, it's nice, right? It's very snappy. It kind of, it's almost intuitive, right? It's an exponential, it's a bounded by an exponential function. It's almost like central limit theory articulation, right? But the, um, the one problem with Hoefding's inequality, or at least one of the problems with it, is that it completely ignores all variance information. So if your data stream consists of a whole bunch of zeros, right, and your sample variance is very low, Hoefding's inequality has no way of accounting for that fact, and its bound will be wide. Right, to remedy this situation, the various other authors throughout time have developed these things called empirical Bernstein bounds, which are effectively almost drop-in replacements for Hoefding's inequality in your application that you can use if you want to, right, that takes advantage of the sample variance of your data. Right? You can just directly replace one for the other, and it might give improvement. 
So the question is with this, like these, these are good. And please, if you want to use these in your applications, please do. But the thing is, well, it's like when you, when you look at the derivation of these, right, and the derivation that we just did before with all of the assumptions that are a little bit hairy, right, you think, well, could we do better? So the first thing is that if you're going to use Hoefding's inequality, like, Hoefding's inequality is nice, but there's, there's better bounds out there if you want to use them. For instance, this bound here is also credited to Hoefing that the man derived on basically the same assumptions for almost the same purposes. And indeed, if you carry the derivation out, the difference between this one and the previous one, the one that everyone knows, is literally the removal of one simplifying mathematical assumption. They're almost exactly the same bound, and this one is far stronger. If you can use this, please do. And if you want to add variance information to it, right, we can use Chebyshev's inequality, or if we want to go hardball, we can talk about Bennett's inequality. This is a concentration inequality that's pretty good. Very hard to beat. There is one man I know of who can beat this. Right? Um, Miguel Telegram. Anyway. And the question is, well, what happened if we started with something as strong as this, right? And we wanted to use something like this in our data stream applications or whatever. And that's the fundamental research question. What happens if we started with something really strong, like Bennett's inequality, and then incorporated uh, variance information? And that's, what, that's, that's the, the orientation of my research, actually. Right, so the first thing is, if we want to do this, we have to follow the same procedure as we did with our little toy Chebyshev's inequality. We need to derive a bound for the variance, the estimator of the variance. And the way we did that is we have to decompose the variance into its two parts. Right? That is, you can decompose the sample variance estimator into the mean, the sample mean squared, and the, at the, the mean of the sample squares. Now it's pretty difficult to get a good bound for the variance, for the sample variance. But it's relatively easy to get bounds for the sample squares and the mean squared. And we, just because why not, developed a bound that looked a little bit like that for the sample squares. <laughs> and using a probability union together with Bennett's inequality created a bound for the variance. Now in the literature at large, right, the, the problem, the thing that makes the variance really difficult to, to bound is because it's a function of random variables indeed a quadratic function of them. And there are two other ways that I'm primarily aware of. The first is with, the, it's called the Ephraim Stein method, uh, also known as the jackknife method of creating bounds for variance, which in conjunction with the choice of bound creates probability bounds. The other one is that there is various literature on information theory that uses entropy methods, uh, particularly the Herbst argument, to create bounds for variance. So we you know, use those for literature, and then we just took the minima of them because we're in the engineering mindset. And using a whole bunch of numerics in conjunction with these, these bounds, so we've got variance decomposition, probability union, Bennett's inequality, and our own special with the sample squares inequality, we created what is numerically a new empirical Bernstein bound. After all the uh, numerics is done, we fit a little envelope over the top and it looks a little bit like that. All right. <laughs> All right. Does it work? All right. So, I mean, one of the example applications that we can have and we did in our paper was to apply it to abandoned algorithms. So one of the, the more common abandoned algorithms that you can come across uh, is called the upper confidence bound method. So the idea is that, you know, your abandoned algorithm has to choose which arm to pull to get the most reward, the idea is that the algorithm chooses the one that has the highest mean plus confidence level. And, you know, concentration inequalities have been and are used to characterize that upper confidence bound. All right, well, how does this work? Well, the easiest way is to throw together a little simulation and to show it does work. So this is an example of a simulation that is, you know, just basically running on beta distributed data for each of the, the, the pools and the rewards of the bandits. And you know, it seems to work pretty well. And the general idea is that if you're using a, an algorithm like the upper confidence bound algorithm, and then you develop a better actual confidence interval for the same method on the same data, you get better performance. Surprise, surprise. 
So another another question you could ask is, well, you know, how how tight is this bound? Right? And so I mean one way of doing that is well comparing it to other bounds. So there's the bound by Mora, Mora and Pontil. Uh, and we can see that by going from their bound to our bound, you shave off about a third. So the, the actual confidence interval shrinks by a third. And then if you go from our bound to what a bound that you could get with perfect variance information, specifically Bennett's bound, you shave off about another third. Right? So by doing all of this numerical process, you get almost like 50% of the way to perfection. Which, you know, it's okay. All right, now, criticisms about this kind of thing. So the first thing is union bounds, which I have used. They're pretty weak. Could we get around using them? Maybe we could. To do that, you kind of need information about the coincidence of the statements that you're unionizing. And, you know, I don't actually know how to do that. But, you know, that could be a potential improvement. The other one is that I, this, I'm sort of a bit of a punter. I, I, I fiddle around in this because I like it, but uh, there are some things that I don't know. Sure. Uh, so I'm not an expert at the entropic and information theory bounds because they sort of scare me. Uh, there is, and I've been made aware of, a thing called optimal uncertainty quantification, which is kind of a numerical technique that might give like perfect information in attacking the problem directly. But more generally, there are, there are other things, right? So all of these bounds, they're single dimensional, right? You've got one random variable, you've got one variance, you've got one sample mean, right? Whereas real world data is multi-dimensional, right? Additionally, all of these bounds assume that you're sampling with replacement, that all of your samples are independent and identically distributed. And in the real world, if you can not sample with replacement, you do. Additionally, statisticians, they don't do simple random sampling, if they can avoid it. They use other techniques like snowball sampling or cluster sampling or specifically what I'm interested in, stratified sampling. And, and this is really the final slide, if you really like this kind of thing, try that. <laughs> Alright, this is, this is the final slide, I promise I'll get off this quick. This is an example of a concentration inequality for the stratified sampling of multi-dimensional vector data that is empirical, that takes account of all of the sample variances of all of the components of the vectors drawn from all of the strata, where the strata are sampled with and or without replacement. Just so you know, so this is the sort of thing that you can build if you're really into this kind of thing. And if you're interested, there's the URL. <laughs> Any questions? So with all the empirical bounds, what's the um, characteristic of the data set that will allow this bound to specifically be tighter than others? Like, is there a common characteristic, or is it a trial and error process? Okay, so the, the idea with these bounds, right, is that they are analytical statements that can apply pretty much for any probability distribution or any data set that you can have. Right, so for any data set that you are taking the sample mean and the sample variance of, these relationships will hold. Right, um, in, the in the context in which these are most useful, uh, so a lot of these bounds are most useful when, like specifically the ones that take account of the variance information, are most useful when your variance of your data is relatively small. That's when they really, really come out of the woodwork. Whereas if your variance of your data is very large, um, then actually it turns out that an inequality like Hofti's inequality or like Hofti's second inequality that I talked about there are actually more appropriate in that context. I'm actually asking about the other empirical percent bounds because they found the uh, variance as well. 
So um, compared to your empirical versine bound and the other derived versine bounds, like what's the what's the edge of this bound and others? Okay, so um, so by by doing the empirical stuff, the the, the engineered stuff that I've done, right? That basically my one takes everything that they do and just makes a pipe. Right, all of the components that they do, I do as well. Just I chuck it into a computer and do all the numerics where they use simplifying algebra. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you, Jan.